Um, and I'd like to invite our moderator for this session, uh, Head of Future Resilience Systems, uh, Jonas Jorin. So welcome everyone to our next session, um, enhancing the resilience of smart cities um, using computer, uh, cognitive computer technologies. Um, I'm very happy to have a great panel with me today on the stage here. Um, I will introduce them in a few seconds. Before that, I would like to highlight uh, what is the goal of this session. We would like to um, present to you how cognitive computing technology can make smart cities more resilient. We also want to give you insights on how cognitive computing technologies can support sense-making and human decision-making. So we will present in this session and discuss how co cognitive computing technologies can mimic the functioning of the human brain and how it can help to improve situational awareness and human decision making. We will look at how artificial intelligence can be applied to detect hazardous events and how cognitive computing can be applied to risk and crisis management. Now let me go to my distinguished colleagues uh, who will present today. Um, on my left side, I have Professor Martin Rawal. He's a professor of geoinformation engineering at the Department of Civil, Environmental and Geomatic Engineering of ETH Zurich. He's a steering committee member of the Center for Sustainable Future Mobility and a member of the Energy Science Center at ETH Zurich. He's also a principal investigator and leader um, of the Cluster on Distributed Cognition for Social Resilience in the Future Resilience Systems Program hosted at the Singapore ETH Center. His research interests focus on spatial decision making for sustainability, analyzing spatial temporal aspects of human mobility and spatial cognitive engineering. Then in the middle, I have Dr. Majid Kader. He is the director of the Home Team Behavioral Sciences Center under the Ministry of Home Affairs of Singapore. He is also chief psychologist of the Ministry of Home Affairs. For the past 26 years, Dr. Majid has overseen the development of psychological services in the areas of stress, resilience, deception, psychology, leadership, crisis negotiations, and crisis psychology. Then to the very far left, I have Professor Mao Kochi. He's an associate professor at the School of Electric and Electronic Engineering at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He's also a principal investigator and leader of the Cluster on Distributed Cognition for Social Resilience in the Future Resilient Systems Program. His research focus is on subfields of artificial intelligence, including machine learning, image processing, and natural language processing, and information fusion. Now, without any further delay, I would like to hand over to our first speaker, Professor Rabal. Thank you, Jonas. Can you all hear me? I guess so. Uh, so I'm very happy to start this session with a small presentation uh, on how to enhance resilience of smart cities through cognitive computing. Um, I want to start with the motivation for that, actually. When we look at resilience of a modern society, which is a really complex system, then I think it's important to emphasize that we're looking at two interdependent parts. So first of all, the resilience of the engineered infrastructure, where we heard quite a bit in the last session, actually, but also uh, the resilience of communities who depend on this infrastructure. And what you can see here in this image is actually uh, are the three um, clusters uh, that uh, we tackle in future resilient systems uh, that take this into account. So first of all, the area of high density urban systems, then looking at cyber physical systems, but also on the social aspects on the cognitive aspects with distributed cognition for social resilience. And uh, we strongly believe that uh, social and cognitive factors are essential for making a populated area such as a city more resilient. And if you have watched the master lecture of uh, Peter Gluckman yesterday, actually he uh, emphasized that highly within the area of climate change, the importance of social science and social factors. 
Now, this is a, a complex overview of the different um, you know, systems and multi-layer sensing possibilities that we have in the city, and this is what we're looking at in the Future Resilient Systems program. And on the one hand side, it is clear that we have lots of static and dynamic sensors uh, bringing us data and information from transportation infrastructure networks, from social media networks, from mobility networks, like all kinds of different networks. But what is all, uh, often forgotten is actually there are lots of actors that depend on these networks and uh, who move within these networks and make decisions for these networks. So this is why it is so important to actually look at the human, social, and cognitive component. And within this framework, we try to uh, get a lot of data, analyze these data, extract knowledge from the data, and then use that to support actors and decision makers in order with the overall goal to maintain socio-technical and social systems actionable. Now, cognitive computing technology uh, and cognitive engineering, what are those? Um, we have seen uh, a lot of cognitive uh, computing technologies actually entering uh, various processes and uh, actually cognitive computing um, you know, makes decisions or helps uh, human decision makers with the help of AI and machine learning uh, and also with signal processing. And then an overall goal would be to mimic the functioning of the human brain. Now these systems are adaptive, they're interactive, they're iterative and contextual, taking context into account. So lots of application areas for cognitive computing as, as, um, exist, such as risk assessment, sentiment analysis, to just mention two of them. Overall, we want to support human cognitive abilities uh, and optimize spatiotemporal processing in real-world tasks. And I have two examples here. On the left-hand side, you see, with the help of uh, a modern eye-tracking technology, this is a hotspot map of where people look at, decision makers look at when making decisions on a map. Um, and uh, by, by integrating that within cognitive computing technology, we can easily you know, capture errors and improve upon the decision making. This is also used, we've done a study with the airline pilots, what you can see here is uh, two airline pilots in, a, in an A320 simulator, where we use gaze-based interaction also you know, to communicate with the system and detect errors. In cognitive engineering, on the other hand, uh, we want to integrate cognitive and computer science approaches to the design and construction of machines. And the, the big goal there is actually you always look at the interaction between these mach machines and the operators, and you want to bridge the gap between the psychological user variables on the one hand side and the physical system variables on the other hand side. Why? In order to improve the quality of human decision making, to make it, for example, less error prone and faster. And uh, finally, I want to present to you a concrete example from our research where, where we take this into account. This is uh, control room operators. Now, obviously, control room operators are, uh, have a big impact also and take part in making a city resilient if you look at the transportation mobility system. Here you have four examples of, uh, of uh, control rooms. And uh, within control rooms, people are surveilling, they're controlling, and they're managing various systems like a transportation system. So the operators work with real-time uh, dashboards, and uh, they have to have a high level of situational awareness and alertness. But often, when different things happen at the same time, they're under a lot of stress, which really uh, um, basically brings with it a high cognitive load. And now the ability of such personnel to overcome stress and maintain a high degree of cognitive function, that can be attributed to cognitive resilience. Now we're trying to create the system here. Uh, I don't want to go uh, too much into detail, but I just want to mention that on the one hand side, you have processes, maybe machine learning algorithms that help you detect upcoming disruptions. Now these are then, this information is visualized in control rooms. And what is very important that not only do we visualize the data and information, but also the spatiotemporal uncertainty. Um, and we're trying to make these uh, human compute interaction processes cognition aware for example, by using eye trackers to find out about the decision-making behavior, uh, the perceptual input, and uh, have that actually help the system to detect errors and counteract. 
Why is that important? Because with that, we can address personal and organizational biases in decision making. In the control room, for example, on the one hand side, we can address personal biases such as selective perception or incomplete information through the visualization of uh, spatiotemporal uncertainty. On the other hand, there are lots of organizational biases, such, such as cognitive failure or group thinking, if you make uh, collaborative decisions, dispersed memory or poor information sharing, which we can address and hope to address through cognition-aware human-computer interaction. So finally, kind of the take-home message, I believe social and cognitive factors, as we have seen in many other presentations, are very important for enhancing a city's resilience. Um, cognitive and computing and cognitive engineering can actually help to foster sense making and improve upon human decision making. And as an example, I showed you how personal and organizational biases can be addressed in control room decision making. With that, I want to close. Thank you for your attention and looking forward to your questions later on. Thank you very much, Professor Rauba, for your presentation. Now we move to the next panelist, uh, Professor Mao. You would be the next presenter. Okay, in my presentation, uh, I will share with you my recent research in the social media analytics uh, for hazard event detection and the social uh, situation awareness. The social media analytics is based on a broad range of artificial intelligence technologies, uh, including the deep learning, the natural language processing, and the information fusion. So nowadays, I mean, surfing social media has become a daily routine activity for networking, for content sharing, and viewing. And many of us are probably uh, consider the uh, social media contents uh, as uh, mainly for fun, and uh, don't take this content seriously. But, uh, but the, in data, the information on social media are quite noisy, inconsistent, and could even be faked. But by analytics of a large amount of social media data, we can still get meaningful insights. Social media can be interpreted as a, a crowd-sensing network where the human plays the role of sensors. So we sense the world, and we report the happening of the world. Among the various issues and happenings reporting on the social media, we are particularly interested in the hazard and also the sentiment and emotions towards the hazards. And firstly, the social media could be used for the detection of the hazard events. Okay. So in the left side, I show some examples of the posts that report the happening of earthquakes and terror attacks and also some flooding and incidents. Okay. So uh, by building a, a deep learning based event detection system, so we are able to separate this kind of post from other posts, and then also own the different posts into the corresponding categories, like an you know, earthquake, flooding, terror attacks, or any other events that are of interest to us. We can also extract the facts about the events from the social media. And the left side of this slide also shows some example uh, posts on the social media. And uh, the first one reports the tree. So these all the posts reports the happening of the carbon tree attack, carbon airport attack. Okay. So uh, through a, tree, a deep learning based information extraction system, we are able to extract the very important information of the events. For example, from the first post, you now we can extract the location and also the victims of the attack. And from the second post, you now we can extract more information about the weapons, the perpetrators, the date and the time of the attack. Okay. So each, normally, each of the social media posts is short. We can only extract a part of the information, part of the facts of the event. So we call this as a knowledge fragments. Okay. So through an information process, we can integrate all the knowledge fragments extracted from the different uh, social media posts to produce an aggregated event knowledge graph. So this knowledge graph shows actually a more complete picture of the event. 
So this is just an example about the terror attack. So for other uh, events like a natural disaster like earthquake, we can also extract all the corresponding information, including the damages of the uh, caused by the natural disasters. And besides the uh, hard fact, and actually we can sorry. We can also extract the soft fact, like sentiment and emotions from the social media. So here actually I show actually an example, and this example, the post is from the Prime Minister of Singapore, and it's about a new measure against COVID-19, and also some comments from the public to this post. So here, and through a deep learning-based sentiment analysis model, and we can um, identify the positive sentiment actually underlying each of the posts. So the sentiment here actually uh, refers to the attitude of the public, can be negative, can be positive, or can be po neutral. Okay. So by analyzing a large number of you know, posts and also the corresponding uh, comments, actually now we can get many uh, meaningful insight. Uh, for example, here, and we can actually uh, uh, get the sentiment score uh, for different topics on the social media. Okay, and for example, and we can get the uh, sentiment score for the vaccines and uh, for the job opportunity program launched last year by the Singapore government, and also the speeches made by the prime minister and also the government officials, okay. and also for each of the topic. And we can identify the main concern of the public. For example, for the vaccines, you know, the safety price are the main concern. Of course, you know, in Singapore, you know, this vaccine is free. Also, uh, through the analysis of a large amount of uh, uh, social media data, you now we are able to identify the temporal features of the sentiment scores. So this diagram just shows the sentiment scores actually uh, Underlying the post collected actually from the last in June until the January of this year, and we this score is based on over ten thousand actually posts and the comments. And this work is on sentiment analysis is done in cooperation with Dr. Majis, which is the Home Team Behavior Science Center. And also, actually, from the social media analytics, we can understand the public emotions. Emotions here refers to the psychological, psychological attitude, including the anger or uh, happiness or unsatisfaction. Uh, okay, so through actually an uh, emotion uh, recognition system, now we can identify the worries and all the angers and, and each of the posts. So now uh, we are working on the causal pair identification of the emotions. We try to identify what facts that, that cause or lead to these emotions. Okay, so now I will just you know, uh, uh, present the useful need of social media, but of course we also meet the challenges in social media analytics. Okay. And the first challenge is the reliability of the social media data. Then, then quite often, and it is noisy, inconsistent. Some could be even faked. Okay. And the second channel is that the social media users are not representing all the population. Okay. So the views of the old people, for example, are not reflected on social media. So we must be aware of this limitation when we interpret the result from the social media. So another challenge is the data privacy and availability. So despite these challenges, I still think the social media others another learns to observe the world. Okay. So we can always get a meaningful result by analyzing a large amount of social media data. Okay, so that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mao, for your presentation. Now we go to the third input, Dr. Majid. The floor is yours. Morning, everyone. Um, so this presentation is uh, by myself and uh, with uh, Great help from two of my colleagues, uh, Stan and uh, Juanita as well. 
So I also want to acknowledge the support that they have given in putting together this presentation. So we are approaching this uh, perspective uh, from the angle of psychological sciences and some of the work that we've been doing. So the, the question that we're asking is, can we use uh, you know, cognitive computing uh, for the effective uh, risk and crisis management in the case of novel crisis? such as, you know, this particular COVID situation that we are in. So, what is cognitive uh, computing? I think uh, in the informed audience, I think you already know what, what it is. But this is just a, a quick recap. Uh, but for, for us in the behavioral sciences, psychological sciences, it's not, uh, it's not your everyday reading. La, so, it's something a little bit different. Uh, but the potential is very great, especially with regards to... Uh, uh, natural language processing, sentiment analysis that Prof. Mao spoke about, uh, situation awareness that uh, Prof. Martin spoke about. So there are, there are many interfaces as well that uh, comes in very handy. Um, so it's actually come uh, quite a long way. So we see uh, on the left-hand side, uh, you see that it has actually been used uh, for COSIA in the, in the, in, with regards to analyzing massive amounts of data. La. Uh, that actually typically would be very tedious and uh, you, you might miss a lot of information. And on the right, actually, with IBM's True North uh, processor, uh, they are beginning to mimic the human brains uh, and the way uh, neurosynaptics actually operate. So it's very interesting uh, and, and holds a huge potential. So... In John Kelly's uh, examples uh, from IBM, he gives uh, many examples of how cognitive computing can be used in the medical sciences, especially with regards to analyzing things like X-rays, MRIs, in combination with natural language of medical journals, textbooks, and articles. So um, this means that you can very quickly process uh, the key elements found in hundreds of uh, years of uh, knowledge uh, and then uh, decide how to process what might be useful when there are urgent crises to be dealt with. Uh, um, likewise, you see the applications in the area of oil and gas and you see it in education as well uh, where you can combine test scores, attendance, information about the students' behaviours and, uh, and, and look at developing personalised educational plans. So the potential is really great when you can um, combine human judgment with the benefits of machine learning as well as uh, other kinds of uh, benefits from cognitive computing. So we're asking this question because in the Ministry of Home Affairs, we are very interested in uh, crisis handling and risk management. So, uh, so we are naturally very interested uh, in the area of how can crisis leaders use this kind of uh, technology? How can they actually uh, benefit from it? And how do we distill key learnings from the crisis literature, textbooks, articles, uh, and uh, capture decision loops, provide feedback to, to crisis leaders, uh, make the crisis leaders aware of what we call situation awareness demons. So these are actually demons that impede uh, situation awareness. Uh, and also checking for biases, which is, uh, of course, a cognitive uh, processor and a natural human process as well. So, um, so, because we do so much work in the area of crisis, and we have a very detailed database uh, looking at various crises all over the world, including crises that have occurred in Singapore, but also the major crises uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, um, so, for example, the BP incident or 911 or uh, Hurricane uh, Katrina, you know, di different kinds of crises and what are the learning points. And uh, we're looking at crisis in terms of four types. With the third one being something that we are very curious about, the novel kind of crisis. Uh, and experts have actually said that, well, if you can define a crisis very clearly, it's not really a crisis, right? If you have a, if you have a well-defined plan uh, that, uh, that's in your drawer, then how big a crisis can it be? It, so the real challenge is actually the novel kind of crisis that uh, uh, is novel because you, it's a black swan, you never expected it or because you denied it, you know. Uh, so it's there and you think it will never happen to us. Uh, and so it hits you badly and it's normal because you don't have processes in place. Um, 
So we have done our own studies uh, for many years, and these are the seven qualities that we have distilled with regards to effective crisis management. And you can see many of our panelists have talked about these kind of qualities as well. Uh, but this is what we deciphered when we, when we did massive surveys, interviewed commissioners, crisis handlers, uh, uh, top people, and, and we arrived at these seven uh, qualities. The uh, number one particularly be very useful uh, for application with regards to cognitive computing because you get speed. Uh, you get a lot of speed with cognitive computing. Number two, uh, you can get uh, systems feedback uh, uh, and, and uh, feedback loops, uh, which will be very useful for situation awareness. But also multiple system uh, feed-ins to give you information and allow you to make good sense making. Uh, and, and the rest just uh, follows, actually. Um, so, this is the, uh, so this is about human information processors. You get attention, perception that are all relevant. And earlier I mentioned this point about demons for situation awareness. Uh, so you get data overload. It's, it's quite typical, right? If you walk into any command post, you will see 30 uh, CCTVs, right? How is it humanly possible to look at 30 CCTVs that are dynamic and constantly changing? Um, should they have alerts? Uh, and how do you distill all that information from a human perspective, right? It's actually very difficult because of the capacity of the human brain. And that's why cognitive computing actually may come in very handy. Uh, mental models, uh, these are actually biases that uh, you may have out of the loop syndrome. So you don't even inc include it or think about it. Attention narrowing, focusing on one thing and missing other things or the bigger picture. Stress and fatigue, which is a very human uh, reaction. So there are biases uh, and our fellow panelists have actually spoken about this and uh, many of you uh, would be aware of these kinds of biases and the challenges with regards to complex situations, lack of resources and so on. So as I pointed out earlier in the first slide, the big concern for us is actually this novel crisis that you see on the right hand side at the bottom. Uh, because you, with the traditional crisis, it's easier for us to draw on you know 50 years, 100 years of uh, uh, of knowledge on how to fight a certain kind of fire or how to deal with a building collapse of a certain kind if the materials are built in a certain way. Uh, and creeping crises like the antibiotic resistance and various other kinds of creeping crises, climate change for example, you see a growing amount of literature that comes about. But it's a novel crisis that uh, remains uh, challenging. So we ask this question, can you develop a dashboard? Uh, can cognitive computing be used this way so you get different kinds of information here. And we've listed some possibilities out of how these various uh, elements can come together to inform the crisis uh, manager or the leader. And putting this together in a kind of uh, table, uh, we would argue that actually for traditional crisis and creeping crisis, uh, it's actually more feasible. But with a normal crisis, I think we are scratching our heads a little bit more to say how What's the potential? There certainly is potential, but how do, how do we realize this potential? How do we use databases if it's something that's normal? Um, and how do we develop uh, warning systems and vulnerability detection systems if, uh, if it's something normal? So uh, there's food for thought, uh, but huge potential here uh, that we could potentially develop something to do to f for, for the area of crisis and risk handling. Uh, most useful for normal crisis, like the kind of crisis we are in right now, um, and, uh, and also to predict the next, no uh, all using cognitive computing to predict the next normal crisis would be useful, uh, but it may also have a lot of false positives. But maybe uh, during this time, we could tolerate some degree of false positives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Majid, for your presentation. Now we have time to discuss about the inputs and deepen a bit on the different topics. So I prepared a few questions, but if you in the hall and also online, if you would like to ask questions, please um, come forward. Um, my first question to Professor Mao, um, you talked quite a bit about social media analytics and and I think the challenge is that we have so much information that can be found on the internet and in, on social media. Mm. Um, how can we make sure that we 
have the right understanding and, of the information and in order to enhance situational awareness, how to make sure we take the right information okay. and make sure that what we analyze will actually enhance our ability to assess the situation. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, so when we talk about situation awareness, actually, simply speaking, it's just about the, the understanding of what is happening uh, around us. And the situation awareness uh, involves three basic processes, the perception and the comprehension and also the projection of the future development. Of course, actually, in this process, we demand a fast and uh, promote and uh, the accurate information. And uh, actually, social media actually provides the real-time or near-real-time information about the events. Uh, it is reported that you know, Twitter is even faster than U.S. Uh, geological survey for reporting earthquakes. Okay, so we can get quick information from social media. Of course, you know, the information on social media may be not necessarily in, uh, accurate, and in any way, the writers or authors of the post are not professional writers. But the good thing is that we have a huge amount of information on the social media. So by analyzing the information carefully, by aggregating the information from different sources, and also we can analyze the uh, trustworthiness of different sources. So finally, now we can produce maybe a accurate and reliable information from the social media. And so that we can achieve actually you know, improve you know, social, our situation awareness capabilities. Okay, yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just want to tell my panelists, if you want to just add to the questions, you are free. Otherwise, I would, uh, would like to go to Dr. Majid. Um, you mentioned um, about behavioral sciences and how important they are. Um, so how do you think when people will react or, or how will people react if technology fails? And we just mentioned about to detect or to find the right information on social media. How important is it that we do still have the individual capability to understand and assess situations? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we deal with this all the time when we deal with uh, a crisis today. Uh, for example, when when the bombs went off for uh, London 77 tubes, right, the train station, uh, the communication networks were down, right, and and the uh, the people responding then were in a loss because we are using our phones all the time, right, and we're messaging all the time, so they forgot that if the phones are down and if we lost that ability to then call someone, what do we do? So I think uh, it's the we have noticed the same thing for various kinds of crises uh, all over the world. So in crisis training today, uh, what we do is we ask this question to senior leaders. We say, imagine your phones are down, right? You can't text, you can't call. How do you communicate? You have 50 men and women in the streets and they're doing different things. Some are cops, some are firefighters. How do you have command and control when the communications is down? And it comes back to uh, basics, really. I mean, if you think about the old days, there were no phones, right? <laughs> so, but they communicated using sound, right? They used Morse code. Uh, and before that, in more ancient times, they communicated using visuals, smoke, right? So uh, we're coming back to the basics, and there's a lot to be learned from there as well to say that what do we do as far as contingencies are concerned? So when the system, we, I think this is a good reminder, the more we invest in very advanced systems, the more we, should, we shouldn't lose sight of what is fundamental and basic so that there is a kind of a backup plan, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a fail-safe plan. Uh, and that's basically uh, uh, the, the human discipline of, of uh, communicating and thinking of uh, what do we do, building resilience, if system fails and uh, having a backup plan and thinking that true. Thank you very much. Um, now I want to move to Professor Raubal and talk about Singapore and basically the situation um, in this context. How can Singapore facilitate sense making and cognitive resilience? Well, I think <clears throat> what I'm going to say does not only apply to Singapore, but you know, in a more general way to many cities in the world. I strongly believe that uh, it needs 
a better integrate in terms of sense making, improving sense making. It's a better integration of uh, various sensor information that targets infrastructure, technical equipment, but also you know what we refer to as human sensors. And this is a more general discussion of integrating, you know, when engineers usually or often look at, uh, and I'm an engineer myself, as I'm saying that, look at uh, engineering problems and often don't take the social side into account. But I think uh, it, it is a very important interplay and, uh, and, and you have to look at the whole picture. What I think is very important for many cases with, uh, to improve sense making is real time information and we have talked about that before. Um, when we look at transportation systems, etc., then what we really need uh, in order to react is real-time information. And I think there is still uh, a lack of that in general. Now, um, in Singapore, there are lots of uh, very good, uh, high-quality data sets. But I think, and this applies to, you know, pretty much any city in the world, that the interaction between um, agencies and uh, the private sector with, with, in terms of you know, data exchange and integration of data could be better so that you don't look at this silo approach. But I think through integration of data, we can make much better decisions and there's still a lot to do in the future, I believe. Thank you very much, Professor Abel. Maybe Dr. Majid, you are nodding. Maybe you want to follow up on the context of Singapore in terms of how can we facilitate sense-making and cognitive resilience? No, I, I completely agree with uh, what Prof. Martin is saying. That I think we, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of debate today about the privacy and data, data sensitivity, and, uh, and that's important. But if we can navigate those kind of issues, I, I think we, the potential is great. The moment we are able to put uh, data together, uh, both and uh, private data, but also other kinds of uh, data. And I think the important question would be, in today's setting, we're gonna get a lot of data. The question would be, what kinds of data will be important? Uh, especially in the area of risk management, what low base rate data, so it's low base rate, but it's important. That kind of data may also be uh, useful, just to add on to what Prof. Martin is saying. Thank you. Go ahead. May I just add a sentence to that? Thank you very much. I completely agree. And it reminds me, you know, uh, decades ago when I was a student, it was very hard to get data. Now we are kind of living in a reverse world. We have so much data that we don't know what is the import, what are the important parts of the data. And we need all these filtering processes. I mean, uh, Professor Mao showed in his presentation with all this social media data. And I think this is such an important point because I believe, and I, again, I want to refer to Peter Gluckman's talk yesterday, because he said we always had misinformation, but nowadays it's an unprecedented uh, you know, case of, of, I cannot imagine if as an individual, you're overwhelmed with information and data. And if you're not an expert, how do you make your decisions? And we see effects all over the world, what can happen based on misinformation. Thank you, Professor Ma, do you want to follow up on this point? Yes, indeed, actually, you know, the data reliability and you know, accuracy are also actually the most important concerns actually, when, we, uh, when we use the data-driven you know, approach to analyze you know, various phenomena and uh, particular data availability. You know, in the past, actually, when we work on some project, the most concern is the data availability. But nowadays, again, it's, it's, yes, certainly we have more data to analyze. And uh, this part the inconsistent information on the internet but because of the huge volume, I still actually you know, believe you know, most of the people are honest people. They publish actually you know, accurate information on the in internet and social media. So we can always, by analyzing a huge amount of data, to get the truth, to get the fact. Okay. So what we know actually is that more and more um, cognitive computing technologies are emerging. More and more social technical systems are being established and I want to ask all of you, and you just raise your mic, um, what are the limitations of these technologies? G, do you want to go first? I should have, I should have picked up my mic a bit slower. <laughs> 
No, I, um, that's a great question, uh, Jonas. Uh, the limitations. I, I, what came to mind immediately when you asked that question is, I think we need to know what we want, right? It's, you know, in the olden days, we had the yellow pages. It's, it's all there, right? But if you don't know what name you're looking for, it's useless. So it's the same with Google or any other data or any other huge right, uh, data set out there. I was going to say you need a theory or you need a concept of what you're trying to do and a model of uh, exactly how it's going to do it. Otherwise, well, you know, you, you get a lot of noise uh, or you will not be able to get what you want. So I think it starts off with, with a good question. You need to have a good question. You want to follow up? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. You okay. Go ahead? okay, so now actually, yeah, I think many people are interested in data and also analyzing the data and using the web technologies like artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence technologies. But sometimes I, I think actually our expectation is too high and we still have limitations in the artificial intelligence technologies in analyzing the very complex data. Okay, so, but anyway, as I know in the past few years, we observed the progress and I also believe in the next couple of a few years, there could be even a more rapid development of the technologies. So anyway, we can always come to that stage. You now we can have a mature technology to uh, analyze the huge volume data to get more and more from the data. Yeah, I agree, we have made a lot of progress, but if you ask for problems, I would rather call them challenges to come to, uh, to mind immediately. So the first thing is we've been employing a lot of AI techniques and machine learning approaches, but as we know, most of the machine learning methods are black boxes. So in the end, you don't want a cognitive computing system to make decisions without knowing why these decisions have been made. So I think a lot of research needs to be done into explainable and interpretable machine learning algorithms. So we actually, because machine learning algorithms can fail too, and if so, we want to know why. And the other thing is, uh, and you're a much better expert than I am on this, but uh, it has been shown that emotions play a big role in decision making. And I think we still have a hard time representing emotional behavior and the impact of that on decision making. So I think there's some research to be done too. Thank you very much. Um, at this stage, yes, there is a question. Francis, please. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna try to articulate this question in a way that is answerable. But uh, when you talk about cognitive um, monitoring or, or and especially uh, social media monitoring, we're not very far from what all these platforms, Facebook, do, and actually a lot of political party now around the world do to target particular individual and target advertising. And there's a debate going on about whether we should regulate the output of the algorithm, of the algorithm itself with the question of how do you actually regulate the black box like you, you just mentioned. So my question, if it can be articulated is, is that even possible? Can you, can you regulate the algorithm? Uh, and, and you know, how, would you go about, how would you go about putting some boundaries on some of these uh, new technologies, new techniques that are emerging? Professor Mouth, you want to pick that one? Yes, indeed, actually. And now, now I think the believe if you watch actually, you know, some uh, social media, uh, frequently you know, we see something uh, probably that, that we don't want to see, but actually they are pushed to us. And uh, this is basically based on the algorithm uh, from, from the, I think the, 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 the media, social media you know, developers or the owners. Okay. And uh, so in such a scenario, too, we cannot get fair information, the information from everyone, from every part of the world. So from, and uh, under such a scenario, our view of the various issues, our view about the world could be biased. So I believe actually this could be only regulated maybe by the government or self-regulated by the, you know, the big companies and to ensure the fairness of the information. Thank you. Um, 
Are there more questions in, in this hall? Please uh, come forward. Um, in the meantime, I would like... Um, can I add on that question? Be because I think it's a really important one which, effect, which has affected our lives you know, forever. Meaning that when you bring in new technology, it can be used for good and it can be used for bad. And we've seen many examples. Um, I think I agree with what has been said there. And I think it's important, and maybe, you know, if you can explain what machine learning algorithms done and how do they come to a conclusion and communicate that, then maybe people will get a better basis for understanding or interpreting the outcome. But regulations are definitely necessary. And, you know, I, my own field is geoinformatics and, and mapping. And, you know, you can give me a data set and I can produce a hundred different maps with completely different messages. And this is very often done in political campaigns, etc. I think we have to be aware of that. We also have to be aware of the uncertainty in the data, that sometimes you get messages uh, you get results that are communicated, but when you look at the data, uh, the data is actually not accurate enough to, to give you these uh, results. And uh, this is a big, uh, for, for us as scientists at least, this is a, a big um, and important topic that we have to be honest in communicating the results and be honest in what we can actually do with the results and what we cannot do or, or forecast. But it's, I don't have an answer, but I think this is a, an, a tremendously important question and problem. Um, great. Um, I have more questions, but I want to always ask you in the hall if you want to add more. Please uh, raise your hand. Um, I want to ask all of you a question regarding the future. We just touched now a little bit that there is more and more information available. We need to be careful about how we interpret the information, how we map it, for example. Um, I want to go back to the individual because the idea of co cognitive computing technology is to mimic the human brain. So at the end, we are still individuals all in this hall and online. There are people thinking all the time. Um, Ten years from now, where will we be? Will there be a lot of computing, cognitive computing technologies that actually take over our work of our brain? Or how important will it still be that we as individuals can actually assess the situation correctly? And if yes, then, then how important will be and what will be the features that individuals, maybe leaders, need to have in order to make the, the right situational awareness and then accordingly the right decision making? Any one of you want to go first on this question? I'll, uh, I'll give it a shot. The you know, the earlier example I, I gave about how uh, communications technology has advanced so much that uh, people have forgot how to communicate in a basic way. I think that analogy can be applied in many other fields of human behavior. There was an article written in uh, New York Times uh, talking about how Google is making us all stupid. Uh, and the reason why it said that, I mean, it was a slightly provocative kind of article. The reason why it said that is because uh, of the, 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 the whole way uh, search engines are designed and, 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 and how certain algorithms give you certain kinds of information. Uh, and, and, uh, and that has robbed us of critical thinking and the ability to think. So this author was then saying, you should actually go back to basics, uh, being able to read again, you know, uh, and, and make up your mind about things. So I think the broader point is, uh, will we lose critical thinking if thinking becomes so easy because of technology? That's the broader point. So I, and an even larger point is, I think uh, as we, I think there's huge potential in this, and I think there's a lot of good that can come out of this, but we also have to balance it with humanity and understanding. So there's a, there's a kind of movement called humane technology that talks about let's go forward, let's embrace it with, uh, with white you know, uh, arms, but also let's know what we're getting into uh, so that we, we, we can articulate the, the downside of certain algorithms. Uh, one good example is if you take huge amounts of data and, and you look at the correlation between ice cream sales, the sales of ice cream and rapes, you find that there's a correlation between ice cream and rapes. But <laughs> the middle variable is summer, 
right? People go out in summer, people get out in summer, and they go dating. But you see, that's where if you don't understand the question, well, sometimes the data isn't useful. So I think having that broader meta understanding of what you're getting into, embracing the positivity, but knowing the limits uh, is something uh, useful for us. Thank you very much. Any other panelists want to add to this? Then maybe maybe I, I just continue on the question. We talked about mobility, we talked about different networks and uh, the ability to sense how these networks are moving on. Maybe, uh, Professor Awal, you, can you deepen a little bit again on how in the future, let's say, transportation networks, how will we assess the situation in the future? Will it be that we have these control rooms where individuals still operate or will it be taken over by machines and maybe algorithms that tell us, okay, now there's something happening and there's an automated warning and there's no human being anymore required. Where do you think human beings will still be in such settings, in operation rooms? Maybe at some point this will happen. I don't see that happening in the near future. I still think that um, within the next you know, decades, we will have human decision makers. And I think it's important. I mean, it relates a little bit of, uh, to, the, to the statement before, what does it actually mean to be human? I mean, if you have taken everything that we do away, like what's the point also, you know? I think I would distinguish between critical uh, information and critical data processing that can be done better by machines, which might still need to be evaluated by people. But on the other hand, also, uh, you know, give some freedom to people to make decisions because this is an essential component of human life, I believe. And uh, to refer to, you know, like mobility and wayfinding behavior, there have been many studies that, uh, um, you know, the automatic navigation systems are very helpful. But uh, when you uh, take that away from people, they're kind of lost. And, and you see that uh, there is a decreased spatial knowledge acquisition. Now the question is, and I also use, of course, navigation systems. They're very practical. But do we really want to get into a situation where we don't acquire any spatial knowledge from the environment at all? I don't think so. So you have to decide between critical data processing tasks that can be done better by machines that support, but they should always be in support of human decision making, I would say. Last question to Professor Mao, critical thinking. This is what we believe in and, and how can you make sure that social media analytics safeguards the critical thinking or much better, how it can actually enrich and support the critical thinking process? Okay, yes, actually the, the social media information is very diverse and uh, uh, could be biased in consistencies and uh, so I think, but anyway, we always, I always think actually the social media kind of network as uh, as this kind of crowd sensing network. Although one person could have a biased view, but I believe that the crowd actually who could produce an unbiased view. Okay. Uh, so of course, actually, when we use the data, and uh, now I think that the data are driven on the modeling or the technologies normally provides only, only the uh, play the role of assisting role, okay? And we still rely on ourselves to make decisions, particularly for critical scenarios, okay? So at least at the moment, I have been working in AI for over 20 years. Sometimes I do very simple experiment, uh, even a very simple sentence, the machine cannot really understand the meanings. We see the limitations of AI technologies. So AI, can only you know, assist us to do work better, but we cannot totally rely on the AI technologies. Yeah. Now I think we, we come to the end of this session. Unless any of my panelists want to raise another point, please come forward. Um, I would like to conclude uh, this session with a, with a few points. Um, I think one point we have heard now is that data becomes abundant. We have from different senses, different networks, we are collecting and, and analyzing information. And we know that algorithms or artificial intelligence is actually challenged by 
uh, correctly um, analyzing this information and then providing the right output in the right format and in the right mapping, for example. So there are challenges in the future. I think we also agree that um, individuals and human beings remain very critically important in, in how to do decision making. So we need to balance between relying on the technologies, on the cognitive computing technologies, and basically safeguarding the abilities of leaders especially, but also individuals and in the people in the general public to be able to assess um, the situation. Um, I would like to thank very much all the three panelists. Um, Professor Abal, Dr. Majid, Professor Mao, thank you for attending this session and contributing um, to it. I would like to thank the online participants very much and also the participants here in this hall and the organizers. Thank you very much. Have a good lunch. Thank you.